us, and they have a really beautiful pollinator sing-along song. If you need lyrics, they were at the check-in table, but please just let me know, hold your hand up, I can come around, hand out some lyric sheets. Um, but at this time, I'd love to introduce and welcome the Honey Bee Steel Band and the Swarm to come up and sing the pollinator song. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, actually, we sometimes when we uh, perform, we call ourselves Pollinators for Peace. Um, because this, uh, at this event, we don't have the steel drum group we call the Honey Bee Steel Band. So sometimes when we perform with the steel band, we also throw in this song as a little bonus. You can come up close. You'll see a table out in the lobby with a bunch of song, uh, signs up there and people dressed like bees. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can sign on to our mailing list and we'll let you know when we're doing an event. So welcome, everybody. This is called Pollinators. Bats and birds, they're in trouble, have you heard? Bats, butterflies, birds and bees, pollinators. Pollinator, 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 it is your nature to fly about from flower to flower. Day after day, hour after hour. These birds, bats, and butterflies, we're killing them with pesticides. Bats, butterflies, birds, and bees, pollinators. Pollinators need protection from harmful human intervention. They are essential to our survival. We can be their partners, not their rivals. If not for them, there is no doubt we would have to do without. We would have to let go of the foods we need and love. Pollinator, 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 it is your nature to fly about from flower to flower, day after day, hour after Busy bees, butterflies, birds, and bats. Let's protect their habitats. Bats, butterflies, birds, and bees. Pollinators. Everybody, here we go. Pollinator, pollinator, pollinator. It is your nature to fly about from flower to Flower day after day, hour after hour. Pollinator, 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 pollinator.
Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, thank you. One more round of applause for the swarm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of VPIRG, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. We are the largest consumer and environmental advocacy organization in Vermont with about 40,000 members distributed all around the state. Some of you may know us because you've received a knock at your door uh, in the summer months. And I am very, very grateful to you uh, if you have had a pleasant conversation, offered a glass of water, or even made a contribution to one of those canvassers at the door. It means a tremendous amount to us. That's how we get our members across the state, how we have the financial support that allows us to run campaigns like this one here today. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I am tremendously grateful for all of you being here, particularly on a night like this. We haven't had enough of them this year, um, and this is really, really special. Um, I'm also really grateful to say that we are partnering with some excellent organizations here today. Uh, some of them that you saw um, in the, uh, uh, who were tabling out in front. Uh, many other partnering organizations have joined us in a campaign to protect our pollinators in Vermont. Um, if you go to the website, Protect Our Pollinators VT, you will find more information about this campaign or, or just POP VT because we try to make things easy. So POP VT is a place to find out more information about the campaign and the petition. Um, I, uh, you may have seen this out front where they were, we were selling t-shirts. We have this petition available. And the organizations that are together joining in this campaign, I'll just read to you what this says. We understand call on the state of Vermont to protect birds, bees, and other pollinators, safeguard public health, and support local farmers by phasing out the use of toxic neonicotinoid or neonic pesticides, and two, helping farmers transition to more sustainable pest management alternatives. It's a pretty simple statement. There's more information about how and why we got to that point. And really, one of the things that we hope to show this evening is the state of bees and other pollinators in Vermont and in the region, the threats that they are facing, and hopefully identify for you meaningful steps that you can all take to help protect our pollinators. Some of those will be what you can do in your own backyard, in your gardens, and some will be to support policy in Vermont that would help, again, transition our friends in the farming community to safer, better alternatives to the treated neonic seeds, which pose a significant threat to pollinators in the state. So that's the idea uh, of the campaign. I will say to Liz, wherever you are, uh, I'm trying to advance that, and it is not working for me. Uh, so I'm trying to be smooth, but not so much. Um, and that, <laughs> look at this, wait, is it that button? All right, I didn't, I didn't actually plan that, but, uh, but here we are. That's why we have Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, um, let me thank Liz for running, the, for really being the primary planner uh, for this event. Liz, will you come and take a bow? <laughs> Liz Harwood. Thank you. And many other folks who work for VPIR who have, have played a role in this are also, uh, not everybody, I see some other folks who, as far as I know, are not working for me, but who have these t-shirts on and they are for sale and they're gorgeous. Uh, so please, if you're so inclined, uh, feel free to grab, uh, pay for one of those and then grab it and take it uh, on the way out, which would be great. <laughs> these are our partnering organizations. Oh, I was just going the wrong way. And then these are organizations who are out uh, front um, uh, tabling with us here today as well. Well, you've heard just about enough from me. I mostly wanted to, again, say thank you for being here. Many thanks to our partnering organizations um, as well. Um, and before I get to Samantha, here are, again, the, the organizations that are partnering together on the Protect Our Pollinators uh, campaign to work with farmers and others to help uh, get to safer alternatives to the neonic pesticides. Without further ado, then, I would like to introduce, we're going to have two excellent speakers here tonight. You are in for a treat. Samantha Alger is a research associate assistant professor at the University of Vermont. She conducts research on bee disease, teaches beekeeping courses, directs the Vermont Bee Lab, 
which is a research and outreach laboratory located at UVM that offers disease diagnostic services uh, for beekeepers in the state. So it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and partner, Samantha Alger. Samantha. I figured out the clicker. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Lots of friendly faces in the crowd. Um, so here we go. So through their pollination services, bees and other insect pollinators provide somewhere around 235 to $577 billion to the global agricultural economy. They're essential for so much of the fruits and vegetables and nuts that we eat. Many of you have probably heard one in every three bites of food. You can thank an insect pollinator. And they're also essential for the uh, reproduction of our native plants. Now, all of you are here, you've heard something about save the bees or protect our pollinators, right? And I think for many of us, the insect that comes to our mind is this one right here. It's the European honeybee, or Apis mellifera. Now, the European honeybee is, an, is a single introduced species of bee. They're amazing creatures. They um, can waggle dance to tell their, um, their sisters what the direction of a source of, of flowers. They produce honey for us. They build these incredible hexagonal structures of comb. And we as humans have learned to domesticate them. And we put them in these boxes and we transport them all across the United States to pollinate our food crops. Um, but they are a single introduced species of bee. They are non-native. And for us scientists and, um, and beekeepers also, we like to think of the European honeybee actually as like a canary in a coal mine situation, where because this is an agricultural livestock animal, we follow their populations fairly closely, and beekeepers can open up a box and look inside to see how the health of their bees looks, um, very unlike the native bee populations. And so any problems that we're seeing with the European honeybees could be an indicator of broader ecological problems for other insects. Like, oh, so what's going on with the honeybees? So this is a survey that was, that gets put forth by the Bee Inform Partnership every year, um, where they ask beekeepers to report their colony losses. And so uh, last year, beekeepers lost about 48% of their colonies. This is nationwide. And this has been going on year after year. So you think about losing half of your cattle or half of your chickens or half of your pigs. You know, this is an agricultural livestock animal. Um, and in Vermont, in case you're interested, Vermont beekeepers reported losing 71.2% of their honeybee hives last year. So what's going on with the native bees? There are 20,000 species of native bees in North America, I mean in the world, 4,000 in North America, and thanks to some new work by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, we know there's somewhere around 350 species of native bees in the state of Vermont. I urge you all to check out this really awesome report that just came out in 2022. As a result of this report, I would argue that Vermont has a much better grasp on their native bee populations than any other state, I think, as a, as a result of this work by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Yeah. Spencer Hardy, there he is, wrote the report. <laughs> He's here tonight. Um, and so what did they find? Uh, Spencer and others found that over 30% of Vermont's native bee species are ranked as critically imperiled or imperiled, and 55 of Vermont's 350 spe species are in urgent need of conservation action. So we know there's something going on with the managed honeybees, and beekeepers feel that these losses are completely unsustainable to, to keep moving on, um, and we know that there's problems with these native bees. So what's causing all these problems? Well, we know it's not one single smoking gun. It's um, the interaction of multiple stressors that are all interacting, causing some of these problems. And I'm going to take you through some of these tonight. These include uh, global climate change, pests and pathogens, pesticide exposure, and the loss of flowering resources and habitat, which Charlie's going to be talking a lot more about it, too, after me. So with climate change, we know that rising temperatures reduces habitat for some bee species. 
Um, bumblebees in particular like it a little bit colder. And some research has found that bumblebees have lost 200 miles of habitat over the past 100 years. Um, droughts reduce forage for bees. When it's not raining, bees aren't producing nectar, and so bee, I mean, plants aren't producing nectar, and so bees don't have anything to forage on. And 75% of our native species actually nest underground, and so you can imagine how floods and fires can destroy those ground nesting organisms' habitat. There's also this really interesting um, thing that's happening that's um, some of us call it phenological mismatches, but it's, it's the disruption of seasonal connections between plants and pollinators. So if you have a specialist bee species that requires a particular plant to be blooming when it emerges, if climate change is changing when that plant blooms or when that bee emerges, there's this mismatch where the plant might not get the pollination services and that bee might not get the food. Moving on to pests and pathogens. Bees are naturally affected by lots of different pests and pathogens, fungus, bacteria, viruses. Um, but if you're a beekeeper, is anyone a beekeeper? Yeah, great. Um, so if you're a beekeeper, this little guy should look very familiar to you. It's, anyone want to tell me what it is? The Varroa mite, right. So the Varroa mite is, in terms of pests for beekeepers, this is enemy number one. Um, they weren't always here. They were introduced to, to North America in the late 80s, and they've since spread all across the planet. And so much time um, that beekeepers spend is really just trying to figure out how to control their Varroa mites. Varroa, they kind of, they're like ticks in that they, are, they latch onto the outside of the bee. They eat the fat bodies of the bee, they transmit viruses, and they suppress the immune system of the bee. And so much time beekeepers are spending trying to control these mites, but it actually it turns out it's really hard to kill a bug on a bug. Um, but luckily, sort of, um, the Varroa mite does not prey on native bees. It's just um, preys on these European honeybees. However, the viruses that these mites transmit can spill over into native bee populations. And some of my previous research, I found that these viruses spill over from managed honeybees into wild bee populations, and that it's actually happening through the shared use of flowers. And so as bees forage on flowers, they leave behind salivary secretions and feces, and another bee will land on that flower and pick up the virus. So it sort of changed my perception when I look out into a field of blooming flowers. You know, I'm looking at these flowers now thinking that they're dirty doorknobs. Where <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's, you know, it's important to know about this if you are a beekeeper or you're interested in beekeeping, um, is that there's this potential for this pathog pathogen spillover to occur and that there's things that you can do to help reduce that or risk this risk of spillover happening. One of the things is actually having a really solid Varroa management plan, because we know these, these Varroa transmit the viruses, right? Um, another thing that we're finding through some of our modeling is that if you plant more flowers, you have a dilution effect where the bees are less likely to come in contact with each other on the same flowers. So more flowers are better, right, for lots of different reasons. Um, another thing that I'll note is that um, we're also seeing this spillover starting to occur with some of these other solitary bee species. And so there's um, companies out there that will sell you alfalfa leaf cutter bees or mason bees, and you can buy these cocoons and put them in cute little houses in your yard. Um, but more and more research is finding that, um, uh, that they're actually a source of some fungal uh, pathogens like Ascospera or chalk brood into your solitary bee species, and that it's causing some declines in some places. So a word of caution there. So moving on to habitat, very briefly. Insect pollinators need a diverse source of flowering plants throughout the growing season, and they also need nesting and overwintering habitat. And I'm going to let Charlie fill in the gaps with that. <laughs> um, but I did want to make a plug for that report again by the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, because they identified a list of habitats that support a high proportion of those unique and imperiled species that I mentioned earlier, which are depicted here on the right. So check that out because maybe you have some of those kinds of habitat in your backyard that's worth looking into. So now we're going to talk about pesticides. <laughs> so when I talk about pesticides, I'm referring to insecticides, which kill bugs, herbicides, which kill plants or weeds, right, and fungicides, which kill fungus. 
Um, and so pollinators can be exposed through a number of ways, either do, through direct exposure when they're out searching for, for something to eat or when they're nest searching or looking for a mate. They can also bring back the contaminated pollen or water or, um, or nectar back to their hives or nests to feed their developing offspring, their little bee babies. Um, and then also, as you can imagine, if you're a, if you're a ground nesting bee, like 75% of our bees in the state here, um, anything that's put on the soil um, is, a, is a place where these ground nesting bees may get, may get into contact with different pesticides. So with insecticides that are designed to kill bugs or insects, it's no surprise that they may harm or kill an insect pollinator, right? But there are systemic insecticides like neonicotinoids, which we'll talk about in a minute, that can um, have a delayed exposure um, where they can stick around in the environment for months or even years after they've been applied. With herbicides, one of the big ways herbicides affect pollinators is because they kill the forage that the bees rely on. They kill all those weeds or flowers, right? Um, however, there's research that is finding that um, some herbicides like glyphosate actually impacts the gut microbiota of the honeybee, making them more susceptible to different kinds of pathogens. And fungicides, for a long time, were thought that they probably don't have so much of an impact on insects. But now we're finding that in combination with different insecticides, they can make those insecticides way more toxic than just by themselves. So now we're going to talk about neonics, or neonicotinoids. They're a class of systemic insecticide, and they're used in lots of different ways, but the majority of their use is actually through a seed coating and on row crops like corn and soy and wheat. And that's a picture of a soy um, seed that's been coated, and I think there's a display somewhere, and you can see they're, they're brightly colored to indicate that they've been coated in, in pesticides. So when these seeds are planted in the ground, the plant takes up some of that insecticide, only about 5% or less, into its leaf tissue, and where the plant will get some protection if an insect bites onto that leaf tissue. But these insecticides are also expressed in the nectar and pollen of the plant as it grows. So this is one way in which pollinators may come exposed to these insecticides, because they're out foraging for those, that nectar and pollen. They are highly toxic to pollinators. And I think oftentimes when we think about pesticides, it kills or exposures, we think of piles of dead bees and they're twitching. But with neonics, it's not that simple and it's not that easy because they're toxic in tiny, tiny, small quantities, like 0.1 part per billion can have sublethal impacts that can cause things like memory problems where the bees can't find their, their locations where they want to forage. They have problems growing larvae or laying eggs, and they also have trouble fighting off disease. And so these things can oftentimes be very difficult to detect um, or, or measure. And as I mentioned earlier, they can persist in the environment for a very long time. So how are bees exposed when they are um, to neonicotinoids from treated seeds? Not just from the plants that are producing the pollen and nectar, but there's other ways. So when these seeds are planted in the ground, the seeds are oftentimes coated in a talc or graphite powder to keep them from clumping. And this, during planting, creates a plume of smoke that then moves across the landscape, and it's laden with these neonicotinoids. And it can end up on non-target plants around these areas where they've been planted, or on soil, or on waterways. And that was a video I took of early this spring. Um, so pollen and nectar of plants, we already talked about that. So as you know, um, as you might know, corn is actually wind pollinated. It doesn't produce nectar, but it produces pollen. And don't ever let anyone tell you that honeybees don't visit corn, because you've all seen it tonight. Yeah, yep. So um, these neonics can end up running off into waterways. A recent report of surface water in 20. 22 from the Agency of Ag has found clothianidin, a neonicotinoid, in many of our waterways, actually in Franklin County, at levels that are high enough to impact invertebrates. Um, so it happens, yes, it happens here in Vermont. 
Um, and also another um, problem is that they leach out into soils and neighboring plants can actually take up these insecticides into its leaf tissue. So even if a plant isn't visiting corn, they might visit the dandelions or goldenrod that might be adjacent to these corn um, that are taking up these insecticides into its um, tissue, almost like a nutrient um, expressing into the nectar and pollen. So we did a little study here in Vermont because we wanted to understand what was the level of pesticide exposure for some honeybees here in the state. And we asked beekeepers to set up pollen traps to collect pollen from incoming bees where the pollen would get pulled off their little legs. And so this is a pollen trap showing you all the little pollen loads that bees came back with. It's very, and it's all different colors because different flowers produce different colored pollen. And then we tested that pollen for 93 different pesticides. And in our first year, we had, um, I think we only tested 16 samples. And we found, I'm going to go back for a second, 16 samples. And we found um, 81 detections of 20 different pesticides, just in 16 samples. And that was, I read it in the literature. It's, this isn't just Vermont, it's elsewhere. But it kind of blew my mind to see it happening here in my, our own backyards. Um, all across the state, southern Vermont, Burlington area, northern Vermont, and out in the Northeast Kingdom, there were four apiaries. And they were sampled once a month for the summer. So um, we expanded that every year. And this year, we've now turned this into a citizen science project where we have 15 beekeepers. We have over 100 samples that we're sending into the lab this year. Um, but you're probably interested in see hearing about the neonics specifically and what we found. So um, from 2021 to 2022, what we found is that 21% of the samples were positive for at least one of the three highly toxic neonics, clothianidin, imidacloprid, and thiamethoxam, and that we always found levels of these neonics um, high enough to cause physiological impacts to bees. And we also found neonics, uh, specifically clothianidin, in goldenrod growing adjacent to corn. And if you're a beekeeper, or even if you're not a beekeeper, uh, you know that goldenrod is a really important nectar source um, for, for pollinators and, a good, and for honey, for the bees, uh, for honeybees to overwinter. So I think a lot of beekeepers. Um, well, so there was some comments to some of the beekeepers in our community. Why don't you just move your bees somewhere else? And so we did a little exercise with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies to see what, what would that even be possible? What would that look like? And so each of these circles represents the flight zone of a honeybee from a single apiary. So an apiary is a bee yard, a place where beekeepers keep their bees. And so there's three flight zones of three different apiaries depicted on this um, image or map of Addison County. And the red represent corn fields, and the purple represent soy fields. Um, so you can see it'd be kind of hard to move the bees given how far that they fly and how much they might come in contact with. So that's all about neonics for now. Um, but in summary, from you know the, this is the the, su the end last slide, the summary slide. What can we do to help the pollinators? So let's avoid using pesticides in our own backyards um, and beyond. Um, being aware of pathogen spillover, we talked about some things that to to help lessen or reduce the risk of pathogen spillover. And then lastly, as kind of a segue to Charlie's work, focusing on planting native plants and preserving and creating habitat is really a key thing here. Thank you. So if we have a question or two for Samantha right now, we can try to take that, and then we'll go to Charlie and our dose. Yes. Because I work at a university, I can't advocate. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Paul's job. <laughs> okay. Is there time for one more? Yeah, we go, let's go one more. Okay. Yes. The question was, the question was, was there such thing as honey before, in the United States before the honeybees were imported? And the answer is no. 
And actually, as, um, as white people moved across the um, you know, westward expansion, the Native Americans actually called the honeybee the white man fly because they'd start seeing honeybees first before they'd start seeing white people moving in. It was an indicator that they were moving west, yeah. Okay, one more. So the question was, with this cold freeze that happened in early May and the fact that it's been so wet and cold, how might that be impacting pollinators? Yeah. Um, so for the, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, for the beekeeping community, you know, I'm, I'm, I, that's where I spend most of my time working with beekeepers. And um, it's actually been a really good honey year, so I've heard, because there's so much water and the bees and the flowers are producing so much nectar, and so the bees are putting on a lot of honey. Um, but we need to have enough warm days for the bees to go out and actually fly and collect that honey. So um, that's my answer in terms of the honey bee. Yeah. I'm not sure how the cold snap would have affected the butterflies, no. Sorry, thanks. I should have said at the beginning as well that both Samantha and Charlie will be available after uh, Charlie gives his presentation here in just a moment. And so there'll be an opportunity if you have further uh, questions for Samantha or for Charlie after his uh, presentation. Um, I also, again, just want to draw attention to, because there was the first question, because uh, for those of you watching at home may not have heard, was uh, why not... Um, Thank you. Uh, why not uh, recommend the passage of state legislation that would ban the use of neonic treated seeds in the state? That's not a role for Samantha to play, but I can play that role. Um, and so V. Perg and our coalition partners are supporting a state policy that would prohibit the use or phase out the use of neonic treated seeds um, on farms in Vermont. Um, our state, uh, just to our west, New York, has passed this legislation. We are right now waiting on to see whether the Governor Hochul there will sign that legislation. Surely it would give a big leg up uh, to us if she signed that legislation, but it did pass through their legislature, and we hope that that can be a model for some legislation here. I'm, I'm not really, is, is, it a, is it a clarifying question that it, you had your hand up, ma'am? Well, I'm not, uh, we can, I'd be happy to talk about that uh, afterwards. And there are actually other people here who work more on that particular legislation than me. So the question was about something that happened in this past legislative session. Um, uh, let me just say, with respect to this past legislative session or any other, none of what we're trying to do is easy. Um, and we are often opposed by some very powerful forces in big agriculture, the chemical and pesticide industries. And so it really would be hugely helpful if you are so inclined to sign, you know, put your name on this petition. This is how we will identify activists in communities all across the state, in legislative districts around the state, who might be interested in being helpful at just the right time with just the right message to just the right person in the legislature. We have some uh, petitions back there um, that my friends Marcy and Liz and Lily all have, wave uh, up here. So if you need that, you can also raise your hand. They'd be happy to hand you this petition right now. And if you haven't hit it, uh, thank you. You can send them down the aisles. Um, they will be available to you out in front afterwards. So that's... That's my pitch uh, on that. Uh, there is something that we can do and uh, lots more to learn, but there is something that we can do in Vermont. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be working with our, very, our many, many coalition partners, including uh, NOFA and, and others who are working in rural Vermont who are working directly with farmers every day. This is not an anti-farmer campaign. I just want to make that crystal clear. Farmers have to work with us and be in partnership uh, with us in this effort. Um, and I think that um, we have a good chance of moving forward if we can, if we can make sure the campaign is cast in that light. All right. 
That's more on the state of the problems. I know, you, I know there are questions out there. There will be a time afterwards. But the state of the problem or the current state of the situation for pollinators in the state, we've talked a little bit about some of what we can do from a, a state policy perspective. Uh, and now I want to bring up one of Vermont's um, uh, tremendous expert resources, not just on pollinators, but on gardening. I don't know if you're anything like me. I love my Sunday mornings. I'm often out in the garden myself, and I'm listening to somebody who, who's it, it, he's just great, um, and he tells me how to be a better gardener. I can't follow all that advice, um, but I love listening to him. Charlie Nardozzi is a regional Emmy award-winning writer, speaker, radio, and television personality, as many of you know. He's worked uh, for more than 30 years bringing expert gardening information to home gardeners through radio, television talks, and tours. He's the author of seven gardening books, three radio shows uh, in New England, and a TV gardening segment on WCAX Channel 3. Please join me in welcoming Charlie Nardozzi. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Paul. And it's great to see you all here on a beautiful, the one beautiful summer night that we had. <laughs> so I'm very impressed that you're doing this because I was looking at them boating on the lake and thinking I could go for Look at it. I'm sorry. I got to go. <laughs> uh, go for a swim. So thank you all for coming. It's, it's really a beautiful night here in Vermont and a beautiful setting to do this. And it's great to see so many people interested in pollinators. Uh, when we first started talking about this, um, I think Paul had kind of modest expectations. And I, I know that he's probably exceeded those exponentially here by the number of people who've come. And it's nice to see some old uh, familiar faces and friends, too. So it's great. So Samantha did a great job kind of laying the, the groundwork of the problem that is occurring with pollinators and touched upon many of the things that I'll be talking on. Um, I'm also, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a bit here. So <laughs> some of the things I'm going to talk about are things that may sound very familiar, but I don't want to assume anything. If I've learned anything in the gardening world in the 30, 40 years of doing this, you don't assume people know things until you, you tell them and you talk to them about it. So some of this information may be repetitive, but some of it might be um, eye-opening for you too. So um, I'm just going to dive right into it here. Um, and not into her presentation, but my presentation. Ooh. Oh, well, there's a lack of benefits with corn. So let's talk about the 83 to 97. <laughs> Takes me back to my master's degree. Okay. Uh, where am I? Oh, there I am. Grow pollinator garden. So. I want to talk about some of the possible solutions to what we've been talking about here this evening about the problem that pollinators are having, the, the dramatic decline, not just in honeybees, but native bees and other pollinators too. And so I'm going to kind of uh, go through pretty quickly the different kinds of pollinators, then talk more about the plants. And, and in that sense, I'm not going to talk so much about specific plants because I could go on for a long time doing that, but talk more in general about the kinds of plants and how to grow those plants and the things that you can do as a home gardener, because I assume most of you are home gardeners, uh, to assist the pollinators and create a habitat or an ecosystem so that they can thrive. That's really, we're not just trying to get them to survive, we want them to stay around. We want them to thrive. We want to be there year after year after year. So first of all, who's a pollinator? <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a pollinator. Uh, well, I am because I pollinated my pawpaw trees this spring, and I have pawpaws. So anyway, yeah, I know, exciting, huh? <laughs> These are things that get gardeners really excited. Pollinators, we've been talking about bees, and Samantha, of course, mentioned about honeybees and bumblebees, the social bees that have nests and hives. But the most important thing to rem remember is what she also mentioned, is that 75% of the native species of insects and pollinators and bees are in the ground, not so much in a hive somewhere up on a tree or in a, a box or some areas like that. There are a lot of bees beyond the honeybee. The honeybee is like the poster child for pollinators, just like the monarch is for butterflies. You know, there's lots of different types. There's sweat bees and digger bees and, and leaf cutter bees and all these other bees that are out there that are doing the job of pollinators. It's just the honeybee kind of gets all the attention. Um, the other, oh, <laughs> the slides are in a little different configuration, so I'm, I'm just picking up that. Uh, the other thing to remember is that, as I mentioned, they're not all just colony insects. They are solitary bees. Many of the bees that we talk about are solitary bees, and that one you probably recognize 
maybe not by its back end, but <laughs> by where it is, is a mason bee. And mason bees are one of those native species of bees that are amazing pollinators. In fact, if you had an apple tree, you would need six mason bees to pollinate that whole apple tree, whereas you would need about 360 um, honeybees to do that same job. So that's why you want to protect the native species as much as some of these other bees that get all of the, the press about them. The thing that the mason bees will do is that they come out early. They like it a little bit cooler than the honeybees. So they'll be out there earlier when those flowers are starting to bloom on your trees. They don't go very far, though, about 300 feet or so around, 300 yards around the, the area of where they came out of. Unlike the honeybee, they can go for a few miles. Um, so you do have to be aware of that too, but creating habitats for them is important. You can certainly buy those little nesting boxes, you've probably seen them with the little tubes in them, or you can do some of the things I'm going to talk about, which is leave a lot of the plant material around in your yard so they can make their own homes there. You don't necessarily have to put up a hotel, they can find their own little Airbnbs wherever they are in your yard. Airbnbs, I just caught that, that was good. Huh? <laughs> um, another one that is a pollinator we don't think too much about are birds, and specifically hummingbirds. So they have the long proboscis that goes into those, any of those tube-shaped flowers that you might have. The more tube-shaped flowers you have around, the more hummingbirds you have. The more hummingbirds you have, the more movement of pollen that's gonna be happening around on all of those flowers. And they are just fascinating to watch. We had a bunch of them this year. I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe it's just growing the right flowers, but I had a, a lot of them, and, and they just keep chasing each other around. It's like they're not playing tag. I think it's more a territorial thing. Uh, but it's pretty fun to watch them uh, go around. And flies. Now, we don't necessarily think of flies. Most people think of flies like mosquitoes, cluster flies, those kinds of the nuisance flies. But there are a lot of flies, tachnid flies, syrup flies, uh, all kinds of different flies that are out there that are actually pollinators. And one of the most fun things to do for yourself to really kind of get in tune with pollinators is to walk into a field of goldenrod, which is blooming now. It's a nice thing to do. Stand there on a hot summer day, and we will get one. Monday, I think, is the one hot summer day we're going to have. And close your eyes and listen. You just listen and you hear all this activity around you, and you don't even, aren't even aware of it. And if you start looking, you'll see all these different flies, all these different bees on those flowers. A lot of them are flies that we don't even really recognize, but they're a key role in pollinators to have these flies and have habitat for them as well. And finally, another one is ground beetles. So, uh, and you don't really think of beetles as a pollinator, but in fact, there are ground beetles that will climb up into flowers and move pollen from one flower to another. A lot of the white flowered uh, trees and shrubs, like uh, magnolias, for example, and spirea, will be pollinated by ground beetles. Um, the other one that our song groups so beautifully sang is bats. I didn't put it up here because we don't really have those fruit bats kind of in Vermont, um, but that's another animal that is a pollinator. So when you think pollinators, don't just think honeybees is kind of my message with all of this. Think of a whole habitat of different kinds of creatures. What do the pollinators need? Well, to start with, they need nesting areas. So um, I'm going to go right to left on this. This is not how, how I initially set it up, but that's okay. We can work with this. So that area on the right is our backyard. So a few years ago, we had this big storm that blew through, knocked down some big oak trees and some other trees. We did harvest some of that wood for firewood because that's how we heat our house, but we also left logs and branches and brush piles around. That is essential to do that. What you don't want to do is what happens on the far left there. That is... Um, my neighbor's yard. <clears throat> not here, is he? Okay. He likes to clean the forest. Uh, and is this, I'm not sure where the psychology of this. That would be an interesting study. It's like, where does that come from? Is it because we came out of the, the plains of Africa, you know, billions of, uh, millions of years ago or whenever it was? But we have this, uh, this urge, or maybe it's the fear of, like, wild animals are going to come get us. You know, the mountain lions are going to come out of the forest and eat us but this urge to clean the forest so you can see through it. We want to see through the forest, right? So that's what he did in his uh, little forest area. Um, he went through there and cleaned up all the understory, took off all that rubbish, that, you know, those branches and things that were just sitting on the ground, raked it out a little bit, and, and now he's happy. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not great habitat for not only bees and, and pollinators, for wildlife and for lots of other creatures. 
So you want to leave things, just like I say with our two little spaniels that I have, and they get something in their mouth, leave it, leave it, <laughs> just leave it. I know for gardeners, that's a real hard thing to do because we want to be out there gardening, right? I want to garden. I want to clean things up. I want to pull things out. I want to deadhead everything. If you can just leave some of the stuff, that's going to go a long way to helping the pollinators. The other things you want to leave are the leaves. When they drop down, the leaves are really important because they create a layer on the soil around your plants, and that's where a lot of these pollinators could be overwintering. So when you remove all the leaves, you're not only removing a nutrient source that will break down and help your plants, but you're also removing a habitat where some of these pollinators will nest. The other thing uh, that you have to keep in mind is you don't want to be cutting back your perennial flowers in the fall. Ooh, I'll say that again in case you thought you misheard me. You don't want to cut back your perennial flowers in the fall because that's what we've been trained. I was trained at our glorious university on the top of the hill to do that, um, but that was a long time ago now. Things have changed, and that's the nice thing about gardening is that you learn things as you go along, and as we learn, we adapt. And what we've learned is that to help pollinators and a lot of other beneficial insects and native creatures, we want to leave all that material there because that's where they might be overwintering. In fact, a lot of them will be overwintering in the hollow stems of a lot of those flowers that you have there. So resist the temptation to go clean it all up like you would that way. You don't want to do that and to clean it all up and go throw it into a compost pile, which for me, as I get to be a little bit older gardener, I'm trying to reduce the workload. And the idea of taking organic matter out of the garden, putting it in a pile somewhere, waiting, then taking the stuff from that pile, the compost, and putting it back in the garden, just doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> you know? So if we can just leave it there, and what ends up happening is you just leave it there, and in the spring, after you get a string, three, four, five, 50 degree days, consistent 50 degree days, then you can start going in and doing your cleanup things. You can just relax. <sighs> I can now clean it up. But when you clean it up, I, I would also encourage you not to remove it, but just to chop it. Do what I call chop and drop. Just chop things down, leave it on the ground. Now, there may be upset exceptions to this, especially if you have a lot of disease on your plants and you want to clean those out, I can understand that. But for the most part, you want to leave that material in the garden because that's going to be material that will break down for the flowers to grow up and whatever plants you have growing, and also material for those pollinators as well. Also, as Samantha mentioned, 75% of our pollinators, our bees, will be in the ground. If you see holes in your ground, I saw a great example of this. I'm not sure what kind of insect it is because I'm not an entomologist, but it's in my container on my porch of geraniums, and there is this insect that is, it's, uh, maybe some of you know what it is. It's actually uh, going out and attacking grasshoppers bringing it back to that hole, kind of chomping a little bit on it, leaving part of it outside the hole. I don't know, maybe someone else is going to come eat the rest of it. I can tell. And then going down into the hole. So I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to mess with someone who can eat a grasshopper. So there's a lot of things that are happening in your lawn, in your, your yard area, that you don't necessarily want to just assume that it's a yellow jacket. Everyone assumes it's a yellow jacket. If I don't get rid of it, it's going to sting me and I'm going to get, and it's going to hurt and all those things. 99% of the insects out there are not going to hurt you and most of them are beneficial. So keep in mind that a lot of the pollinators will be solitary and may be in the ground as well. Also, another thing they need is water. And this year has not been an issue, as we, we know <laughs> about having water. Uh, but there's many different ways you can provide water. This is a simple way. Uh, I was mentioning about those trees that blew over, and we cut them down, what was left of them, and left some stumps. And we found that some of those stumps had a hollow heart. So I just leave, I left those there. And what happens is the water accumulates in that hollow heart. And that's a great place for a pollinator to go to get some water. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mosquitoes, right? Let's be practical about this. We've got a little thing of water here. How many mosquitoes could really be in there, right? It's not going to be that many mosquitoes. Uh, but that's one way to have a water supply. Another, of course, is to have bird baths out, not just for the birds, but for the bees as well and for all the pollinators, or have a, a pond or a stream that would be there as well. So there's a lot of different ways that you can provide some moisture. And even you can go as far as creating what we call mud puddles. Anyone ever do a mud puddle? 
oh, this is a fun thing to do about Joanne, of course, with kids. <laughs> so what you can do is find a spot that uh, will get some full sun. If you have clay soil, I don't know if anyone in Vermont has clay soil. <laughs> That's probably even better. If you can hollow it out a little bit, make it a little, little indentation in there with some clay soil, and then just fill it up with water and let it drain. And then every once in a while when you think about it, and especially in your water in your gardens, and you feel like it's a dry day, just throw some more water in there. What will happen on a sunny day is you get butterflies coming in. And you'll get some bees, too. And not only are they interested in the moisture, they're interested in the minerals that are in the clay as well. So it's a nutritional feed for them at the same time as one where they're getting some moisture, too. So create a little mud puddle. Fun thing to do with kids and grandkids. And of course, this is from the Xerces Society. You want to leave undisturbed areas. Uh, this is, can be a part of your lawn that you just let grow up. Uh, that's one thing you could do. You can have a little area on the side of your house, um, in the back area, wherever it is. But leave an area that's just going to grow up into to grasses. Or you can be pl uh, planting things, like some of the, the little blue stem. Or some of the bunching grasses are really good to have. Uh, one of the things that uh, people often uh, have been talking about is a way to uh, support pollinators was this no mow may. Anyone heard of no mow may? What do you think of no mow may? Uh, oh, that's a subject. I'm sorry, I disagree. <laughs> yes, because no mow may encouraged people to not mow their lawns in May. What do you think they did in June? And July and August, a lot of them they were mowing. So what I would rather see people doing is creating areas in their yard where they leave it unmowed and just let it grow up. And then if they need to have their lawn, let's have them have some lawn. Because we're in a place where we need to bring in more and more people, people who normally don't think about pollinators like we do, but just are, have a, a homeowner with some lawns. And it is, um, maybe they heard an idea about protecting the, the, the bees or the butterflies. How can we approach them in a way that's really an, uh, an easy thing for them to do? And that is one of the things that I think would be easier. Just ask them to leave some areas around their yard that is not mowed down or mowed down infrequently so that it will be a place for pollinators and for the flowering plants. And of course, avoiding the pesticides. And Samantha said that very well, so I won't even linger on that one. So creating a pollinator garden. How many people have a pollinator garden? That one that they have dedicated to pollinators. Yeah, I said I'm preaching to the choir. OK. <laughs> so we'll, we'll move through this pretty quickly then. What are the plants you want to do? First of all, let's not get so fixated in all the plants you can buy. I love to buy plants as much as anyone else out there. But pollinators will really be able to thrive with a lot of the wild plants out there. I'm calling them wild plants and not weeds. And one of the best ones is the one on the right being the dandelion. I have a friend who lives in Heinsburg, and he raises bees. And I was there one spring day um, on his property gathering ramps, wild leeks. And I was just chatting with him about the bees and how they're doing and how was the winter and not so great. Then he said he pointed out to the field. But once those start blooming, things will get better. And I looked at the field, and it's like green, like right? what's there? And what he was pointing at were all the dandelions that were going to be there in a, probably a week or so. Dandelions are great. They bloom en masse. They bloom early. They have pollen and nectar for the bees to, to uh, forage for. So having areas of your property that you just let the dandelions grow is a great thing. And if you're someone like me, you like eating dandelions too. The greens are great. They're nutritious. You can make wine out of them. You can make a co coffee substitute out of the roots. They're a nice plant to have. So dandelions in the spring are great. And then this time of year, we've talked about goldenrod. It's a really nice plant to have in the property. If you have patches of wild areas you can just let grow up and let the goldenrod come in, it's going to be a great plant to have. And then there's clover. So the state flower, do you know what the state flower is? Red clover, exactly. Yeah, red clover. Uh, so red clover is a beautiful plant, good pollinator plant. Um, and this one I do, I want to tell you a little story about. The white clover, the ladino clover, the Dutch white clover. This is a clover. It's not native. This is one that came out of, of Europe. Like a lot of our plants came over with the European colonists a couple hundred years, 300 years ago or so, 400 years. And this was something that when you bought grass seed, like in the 1920s and 30s, there was always a percentage of that seed is clover. 
because they realize the benefit of it. A clover, of course, is a legume, fixes nitrogen. It will stay green during drought times. You remember drought, right, that word? Yeah. That's when you don't have all this rain. Uh, so it will stay green uh, during drought times. And the flowers are a great pollinator plant, a uh, great pollinator flower. And in fact, I came back from a, a garden conference in Minnesota, and Marla Spivak was out there. She gave a talk about bee lawns, which I'll talk about in a minute. But she said they have identified 55 species of native bees and pollinators on white clover. 55 on white clover. So anyway, white clover was included in grasses, and everyone was happy about it. Then came the Second World War. And after the Second World War, the agricultural and chemical industry had all these herbicides left over, you might say. And they wanted looking for ways to market them. And so what they found is that people in the 1950s were buying houses, creating lawns. And they thought, oh, we can get people to spray it on their lawns if we had a bad guy, if we had a villain. So they started saying that white clover, you don't want clover in your lawn. You want to have a nice green lawn without any flowers or bees in it, because it might sting you. And so that was the advertising for years, for decades, that they had that advertising. Luckily, that has changed, and they don't do that any longer. But that was kind of the background for why people think of clover as a weed and not so much as a beneficial plant. So creating a bee lawn, I, I was at that uh, conference I was just mentioning, and they've done some interesting research about this. And this, for me, is another representation of how can we get someone who just has a lawn to kind of take one step towards doing things to help pollinators. And what they found is that they can seed lawn with certain types of low-growing or low-flowering plants that will be able to flower and support the pollinators and at the same time be mowed. That's called a bee lawn. So they were using three plants in particular. They were using the white clover there. They were using, um, well, there's a fescue grass. I think they're a little blended in there. OK. <laughs> um, on, the, on, the, on the right over there, uh, that's a um, fine fescue. So if you have fine fescue grass, or if, you can, if you're starting a lawn, start with fine fescue grass. That's better than something with Kentucky bluegrass in it. Um, it's not essential, but it will make much easier to get the bee lawn flowers uh, established. In the middle is a flower called Prunella or Heal All. You probably know that one. It's blooming right now. You see it all over the place. A low growing kind of purple little flower. So they put that in there with the white clover and also with a creeping thyme. So they had those three plants mixed up, put it in the lawn. And how they did it is that they mowed the lawn area that they were going to seed really low. They scalped it really down low, um, usually late fall, like October, November for Minnesota, which would be similar for us, same, same kind of climate. They raked off that grass, they aerated that soil, and then they threw the seed in there. They, they put all the seed in there, watered it well for a few weeks. Then next spring, the lawn started growing. That first mowing, uh, in the spring, they mowed it really high, like six inches high, just enough to kind of keep it, the grass down so the light can get into those little seedlings. But then after that, every two, three weeks, they would mow it three to four inches high. And what that was is the height was high enough so that the clover, the prunella, and the uh, thyme would all be able to flower, and yet it still looked kind of like a lawn. So it's kind of an interesting idea, and they've had some good success doing this. Just by mowing a little bit higher and having the right kinds of species in there, they're benefiting all the bees that are using those species for pollen and nectar, and still having people feel like they have a lawn area in their yard. There's information, where is it? Right at the bottom down there. I would just uh, Google probably Bee Lawns University of Minnesota, and it'll send you to that website. Um, anyway, so. Those are some of the things that kind of in general you want to think about. And then we want to think about what kinds of plants you're going to grow. And don't discount trees and shrubs. You know, we talk so much about pollinator plants, and it ends up being a lot of fla flowers, herbs, things of those nature. But trees and shrubs play a really key role. And of course, we all know him, right? <laughs> Doug Tallamy, his book, Bringing Nature Home, talked a lot about this. And his groundbreaking research, for those who don't know, Doug Tallamy, he's an entomologist, or was, I think he's retired now, from the University of Delaware. And he did some research. This is what, this is what professors do, right, Samantha? Send the research to students out there to do these, these tasks that you never want to do. Said, go out into the forest and count the number of butterfly and moth larvae that you find in the trees, <laughs> the number of species species of them. So they did that, and he was just kind of curious. You know, he was counting them for the trees that were around campus and in the, in the forest around there. And what he found out that there were certain trees that had a lot more of these 
moth and butterfly larvae in them than other ones. And he called these trees the keystone species. And what he found is that 5% of these native species supported 75% of the pollinators. So it's not just about planting a native. It's planting the right native for your area. And if you want to find out what your keystone species is, he, he teamed up with the National Wildlife Federation. And there is their native plant finder. And you can go in there. Put, I think they do it by zip code. You put your zip code in, and then these plants pop up, and they'll tell you which ones will be the right plants for your area. So he did that down in the mid-Atlantic area. Um, and he came up with the best woody plants. So anyone want to guess what's the number one species that had one number one uh, tree or shrub that had the most species of butterfly and moth larvae? You read the book, didn't you? <laughs> 534, yes. And then these, uh, you can see black cherry, willow, birch, poplar, and, and crab apple. Those were the top ones. What made me smile is that I have all of those in my yard. <laughs> but what I, I mean to bring up with this is that if you're thinking of planting a big tree, or you're planting some habitat, or you just want to fill an area in to get some shade or block a view or whatever, Think about this. Use this as a filter to decide what you're going to plant. Plant the oak trees. Plant the willows, the birches. Plant the native versions of them. Willows, don't plant the nishiki willow, for example, you know, the ones that are all colorful and turn into this huge monster. You know, plant things that are native if you can. But the idea is that those are going to be the species. And they also checked other plants like street trees in the area, like ginkgo. How many different species of moth and butterfly larvae do you think are on ginkgo? Two. <laughs> that was it, compared to 534 for the native oaks. So it gives you an idea of a filter of, of how to look at some of the trees and shrubs in your yard. So how to choose flowers. Let's uh, wrap it up with talking about different kinds of flowers for pollinators. Certainly you want to have flowers that have a lot of nectar to them, and of course flowers with pollen to them. I always love seeing bees like this. They're just like they went to a party, you know, and they've just been rolling in the, rolling in the pollen. It's like, wow, this is so great. <laughs> and um, this is, Samantha mentioned the waggle dance, and I, I was fascinated when I first heard about this years ago. How many people are familiar with the waggle dance? How many people have done the waggle dance? Ah, <laughs> there you go. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> well, for those of you who aren't, I'll, I'll briefly explain what it is. Uh, scientists found out, and I just learned from uh, Gerald here, that's the scientist who found out about the waggle dance won the Nobel Prize for it, which is pretty wild, uh, that uh, the, the bees are social creatures. And when a bee goes out foraging and finds a source of pollen, they have to be able to communicate it with the rest of the bees in the hive. So they come back, and there's literally a dance floor where he comes down there, and all the other bees come out to like check them out. Yeah, yeah, where you been? Yeah, well, you can good. You got some pollen. So, so they check out the pollen. They check out the quality of the pollen, you know, where it is. And if they decide it's something good, then that bee that's got all the pollen is going to have to somehow communicate where the pollen is so everyone else can go out. So what they'd start doing is a waggle dance. And so the waggle dance is kind of a figure eight dance with a straight line through it. And they do the straight line in the direction of where the pollen source is. And for how long they waggle tells them how far away it is. So if you thought you were the human beings were the only intelligent species on the planet, mm, yeah, try a waggle dance. <laughs> try communicating where the food is in the house by waggling in a direction for a certain period of time and see if anyone understands. So, and then what they do is they all go out and they gather their pollen. So it's really kind of a cool thing. I will not do a waggle dance for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, you're really looking forward to it. Uh, so what, how are you going to grow your garden to get all these plants in there? So we talked about the dandelions and one of the benefits, they all bloom en masse. Plant flowers in clumps, large clumps of flowers. Don't plant one of this, one of that, that kind of thing. Plant clumps of bee balm, clumps of phlox, clumps of rudbeckias, big areas so that when the insects come in, there's a lot of pollen, a lot of nectar for them to, um, to partake of. Also have plants or flowers with different shaped flowers soon, different shaped blooms. Like the yarrow have a landing platform, Queen Anne's lace, dill, fennel flowers, those flat flowers, you'll see certain pollinators like those. They can land on them, they get their pollen, they can have a cappuccino, and then they can move on. 
Um, or you look for flowers that have radial symmetry. Radial symmetry means when they're flying above, they look down and they could see that if you cut that flower in half, the left side and the right side are mirror images of each other. So Shasta daisies, Rudbeckia, Galliardia, um, Coreopsis, all those kinds of flowers. Have a tubular shaped flowers. Wow, what happened to that? Oh, there it is. <laughs> tubular shaped flowers, like I was mentioning before with the hummingbird, the, uh, everything from a trumpet vine to a salvia and a lobelia, anything that would be uh, something attractive to a, a pollinator that would try to get their nectar and pollen, pollen that way. And fragrance, have fragrant flowers, and as hyssop. Basil is a great pollinator plant. I always grow extra basil in our garden and let it flower. You know, I was taught all those years that you should always take the flowers off of your basil, right? So you get more leaves. Well, just plant extra ones and leave the extra ones, let them flower, and they're gonna be a, a great source of pollen and nectar for the pollinating insects. Um, I also grow mint underneath a lot of our uh, trees that are in our yard. So instead of putting mulch rings, I put mint rings around them. And right now the mint is flowering, which is great, uh, and, and the bees are enjoying it. And the mint, if it escapes in the lawn a little bit, I don't care, because when I mow the lawn, I'm smelling mint. It's like, ah, oh, that's so nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, look for fragrant plants for pollinators as well. Of course, the idea of blue and yellow is for bees. They don't really see red so much, but they see other things, ultraviolet. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're just going to grow blue and yellow flowers. You know, grow a variety of flowers in a variety of colors for all kinds of different kinds of pollinators. So diversity is really key with the, the, pollen, the pollinator flowers. And also, think about heirlooms and hybrids when you're buying plants. So heirlooms are those open pollinated plants, uh, like this Nicotiana alata there, uh, that are great pollen pl sources, great pollinator plants. You need those kind of plants in your landscape. Hybrids, though, have been hybridized for various reasons. And some of them are hybridized for convenience and for uh, continual flowering. And so you often will get sterile hybrids. So this one you can kind of see here is a Cleome called uh, Senorita Rosalita. It does have nectar, but it doesn't have pollen. So it's a sterile hybrid. So you can have some of those in the yard. I'm not a purist about flower gardens. You can certainly have some of those kind of plants in your yard, but make sure you have enough open pollinated plants in your yard too for those pollinators. It's important to have um, both of those. The other thing is you want to avoid unusual hybrids. So the one on the left, everyone knows, is Echinacea. The one on the right is a toy poodle. Uh, <laughs> no. That is also an Echinacea. That's called hot papaya. That's the variety. There's another one called milkshake. Uh, great names, not so great flowers for pollinators because they've been over hybridized. And it's not just the idea of sterility in the flowers, but it's also the, the insects don't recognize it. They're flying around. They're looking for the echinacea with the cone and the petals around it, they're not looking for this thing that looks like a toy poodle. So you want to make sure that you get the right plants. And it's always good to go for natives, like the Asclepius tuberosa here on the left. But they've also done some research. In fact, the University of Vermont did some research about this, about a group of plants called native vars. These are native varieties that are kind of one step removed from the native, but not so far removed that the pollinators don't recognize them and they're not helpful to those pollinators. So the one on the right is called Hello Yellow. It's an Asclepius tuberosa, same type. Looks the same with, with the foliage and the growth habit, but the flower color is different. The same is true with uh, some of the echinacea. I grow a group called Cheyenne Spirit, a seedborn echinacea. Different colored petals on them, but it looks like an echinacea. So I see all the pollinators on those just as much as a, the native. So you can go a little far afield from natives, just don't go too far afield so you won't be able to recognize them. And then the last word about milkweed. Everyone wants to plant milk. I get so many questions about, I want to plant milkweed in my butterfly and pollinator garden. And what they want to do is, of course, go out to a field and dig up some milkweed and put it in their garden. That's common milkweed. Uh, that is a very prolific plant. In fact, it'll take over your garden. It'll take over your yard. It'll take over your house <laughs> if you leave it long enough. So you don't want to use that. So when you're thinking about plants that are native that might be good for pollinators, also have a little filter about, is this going to work in my yard? There are purple milkweed. There's swamp milkweed. There's world milkweed. A lot of different types of species that are better adapted to home gardens than the common milkweed. And of course, there's the Asclepius tuberosa or the butterfly weed. 
So hopefully that gives you some ideas about how you can change your behaviors or support the things you're already doing. So you can go home to your spouse, your friend, your partner and say, ha, Charlie said it was okay to do that. <laughs> I've been doing it for years. You can also get involved. I know the Pollinator Pathway folks from Addison County. Where is, there, there they are right there. Um, do people know what Pollinator Pathways are? No, okay, I will explain them to you. So Pollinator Pathways started actually down in Connecticut, Connecticut, uh, Wilton, Connecticut on the border of New York State. And there was a group of garden club folks down there who wanted to support pollinators. And what they realized is that it can't just be a pollinator garden here, a pollinator garden in someone's backyard, and all these vacant areas in between, barren areas. There needs to be a pathway. That's how it's going to work. So what they started doing is working with local libraries, schools, civic areas, creating public pollinator gardens so that these pathways would start working throughout their areas. And this movement has spread, and now it's in Vermont, the pollinator pathway folks here in Addison County. Um, I think there's some up in Stowe, you mentioned, in Lamoille County, too. Um, good way to get together with other people who are involved with pollinators. It could be just encouraging neighbors to grow pollinators in their backyard, or it could be working on a civic project where you're putting them in public places as well. And there's a lot of great information. They get speakers to come in and all kinds of information. So supporting pollinator pathways is a good thing. And just creating more pollinator habitat is exactly what we want to do. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you coming out. And um, I think we'll take some questions, right? Uh, thanks so much, Charlie and Samantha. So we have, it's about 7.05 or so. We are going to uh, end by 7.30. Um, uh, if we have questions that last that long, we're happy to try to take those for either Charlie or Samantha here. Um, what I ask is that you try to uh, make it as brief as possible. I'm going to have to try to repeat the question again because we're recording this and folks are watching some live and some will watch it in tape later. Uh, so try to make it brief and, and an actual question uh, would be awesome and I'm going to try to move around. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, um, are there do you, studies that you know of or studies that may happen that would look at how pollinator species may have been affected by the flooding that we've experienced this year? Samantha? Is this on? Yes. yes All it right. Is. <laughs> Where's Leslie? Spencer. <laughs> so um, I am not aware of any specific studies that are going to happen. However, there are many people in the research community, like Leslie, who just finished her first year as a PhD student, who had, um, or who is doing a study in blueberry, looking at how you can plant um, uh, things around blueberries to attract pollinators, but also try to keep pests out of blueberry crops. And her first field season was flooded, and so. As a researcher doing field work, you kind of shift gears and say, maybe I'm also going to be looking at bees in flooding territories now. So um, that's just one example. But I think we're all sort of, by doing the work we always do, we're going to have a weird year and, um, and be able to draw some conclusions about how the flood is affecting. Another example is we're seeing really weird things with some of the pathogens that we follow in honeybees with nosema loads. That's a fungus um, doing really weird things this year. So. Okay, yes, uh, uh, Spencer, or no, sorry, yes. to your right, yes. How are the ground nests affected by the jump I'm sorry, the, the question is how are, uh, can you repeat that? Ground nester bees affected by the jumping worm. Okay, how are the ground nester bees affected by the jumping worms? Do either of you have a thought on that? Where's Miriam? <laughs> Do you know? Can we read up here if you want to answer this? 
Come right up here. Miriam studies those jumping worms. No, no, right behind this microphone. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, there is, honestly, there is nothing about jumping worms and ground nesting bees yet. Uh, but we are thinking about doing some research, but we're always looking for funding, so that's been the problem so far, to not to work with that. The only thing I would say is uh, people sometimes, because no one wants to have jumping worms, uh, they do some kind of like control measures that are not really very thoughtful, like, uh, I don't know, I've heard like flaming gardens or like pouring soap or vinegar. Mm -hmm. You could kill anything else in the soil too. So those are, I would say, other than uh, hand picking them for now until we find a way to control them, probably just don't do anything. We don't know how they affect ground nesting bees. And yeah. I'm Thank so you. glad you're here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Miriam. Yeah. Yeah. This is awesome. We have more experts in the crowd here than we knew. Um, uh, yes, we're here. Could you put the slide back up with the Addison County with the uh, and the uh, Sure. Yeah. And the question on that, the question on the next question uh, is on the study that you did with the Mia Mississippi and the county around the state, which of the county was it separated into? So the, the question um, was, it was a question about Addison County, I think is what we're looking for. And the, uh, the image that showed, here we are. Um, Samantha, we want to repeat this and then. Yeah. So I, I believe the question is about the distribution of the neonicotinoid detections that we're finding and whether we're finding them more in some counties over others. Okay. <laughs> so the first year of this study, we only had 18 samples, and it was just one in every county. Um, I will, or four samples in each county. That's 16 samples, 16 samples. Um, and what we were finding is that we, we were only finding the neonics in places where there was... Um, treated corn or soybean near those sites. And so as a result, this year, we, did, we expanded the study. We have a lot more citizen or community science beekeepers involved. And we identified bee yards that are either near treated row crops or not near treated row crops to look at those differences. Um, I will say that the surface water report, looking at neonicotinoids and surface water by the Agency of Agriculture, I think the only county that they found the neonics was um, Franklin County. Yep. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Yes, wait, I'm in back. Yeah. Just shout out if you can. First, first question is about deadheading, uh, when and whether and how. Uh, and I, I didn't quite catch the second. The second one is soil testing. Soil testing for neonics. So deadheading and soil testing for neonics. Charlie. So uh, yes, deadheading. Uh, that is one of those horticultural practices we're always taught to do. And it's very beneficial if you want to keep things flowering. So you deadhead your bee bomb, for example. If you do it early enough, it'll send up a second flush of flowers, maybe even a third flush. So it's, it's good to do that. And I think, again, in the horticultural gardening world, we, want, we grow flowers because we love to see flowers, not only to support pollinators, but to see them ourselves. So I think it's fine to go ahead and deadhead. But the last one, you know, the, maybe this time of year, the ones that are flowering, those are the ones you probably want to leave later. Because not only will they be helpful to pollinators, uh, you get plants like the rudbeckias and the echinacea that will be great sources of seed for birds, for finches, for example. So the ones that are 
be blooming more late summer, fall, I would leave those through the season. But earlier in the year, you can certainly deadhead and to get to more flowers to, to come up. So the second question was, are there soil tests you can do for neonicotinoid residues? And um, what I didn't mention in my talk was that we are also testing soil and plant tissues in addition to the pollen samples that the beekeepers are collecting. And so, yes. And you yourselves can also send in samples um, because the lab we use is Cornell's Ecotoxicology Lab. Um, and it is, I think, $90 a sample. Or you can get in touch with our lab and we have funding to test the samples. And so we're probably going to be doing it again next year. If you want to be involved and get something tested, reach out to me and I'll work with you to send the samples in because we have another batch that we're sending in. Right, Sydney? Yeah, in late September we'll be sending in another batch and we're happy to include more. So. Yeah, so with the soil sampling, most of the soil sampling could, that we were doing... Can you just repeat? Oh, you're talking about leaf tissue? Yeah, we're doing, we're sending soil and, and plant tissue. That's what I'm saying. So how do you find it? Can well, you just uh, repeat that question real quick? And oh, then, sorry. And then we'll get beyond some of that very specific stuff, but yes. Yep. This is very technical. <laughs> yep. Yeah, sure. So the question was, how can you time the sample collection to ensure that the UV light does not degrade the sample? Good question. So we did our sampling this year at different times to try to um, uh, kind of to capture certain windows of so that during the dust time when the plants, when the seeds were being planted. And so we asked beekeepers, this was the strength of doing a community science project because they were all monitoring their fields. And so they collected their soil samples, their plant tissue samples, and their pollen samples within a day of the plants, of the seeds being planted to try to capture it before it was broken down on the soil. Yeah. Um, and then for the plant tissues that we'd be collecting this time of year, the idea would be that it's inside of the plant at this point because it's plants that have taken up the neonic residues from the soil, much like a nutrient. So we, there wouldn't be the UV degradation at this point. And that, that was what we found in our samples that we had tested last year was goldenrod uh, or, you know, solidago growing adjacent to corn. We found the neonics in the goldenrod. So it was in the plant. Yeah. Well, you have a question sure. way in the back and then I'll move towards the front, okay? You want to repeat? Are sure, you... I think I heard that. Um, the question was, are you sampling only around agricultural fields but or also other managed areas like golf courses? Okay. So this is where it gets sticky. So we got... <laughs> <laughs> because we're doing this sort of as a um, community science project and we're working with beekeepers, we were kind of working within the areas where beekeepers have their apiaries, which is surprisingly very often near treated row crops like corn and soy. So that's where we were predominantly doing our sample collecting this year. Although there are places where beekeepers have apiaries not near row crops and not near things like golf courses, um, where those sort of serve as our control group for this work. Um, the reason why we really focused on row crops in this research is because of the anticip well, a couple reasons, because the neonicotinoid treated seeds used in row crops is, is prophylactic use of, neon of, of an insecticide. It's not using integrated pest management practices, and it's really bad for the pollinators. And because of those issues with using, non uh, using treated seeds, there are lots of policy changes that are coming down the line that we're anticipating coming. And we've seen it happen before in Vermont. And when I've given es expert testimony on the impacts of neonicotinoid treated seeds on pollinators, referring to the so much literature that's out there, 
the question that I get is, yeah, but what about Vermont bees? And so in anticipation of this question coming up, we wanted to have data on what bees are bringing in in Vermont near treated row crops. We would also, it'd be a great thing to do also near golf courses because turf grass is also a seed that's um, coated. That's right. Yes, ma'am, uh, in the glasses, did you have a question? No? Yes? So, the, so boiled down, the question is whether we have any information about whether the excessive rain, not necessarily the flooding, but the rain that we have been experiencing this year has affected uh, pollinators. I'd be curious if um, Spencer or Emily May had any ideas about that as well. But my thoughts is, um, are that the ground flooding and the rain could definitely impact any ground nests of, you know, of nesting bees in the ground, right? Um, also, I was thinking about the colder weather and maybe um, that delaying the time of emergence of some insects. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Emily or Spencer, other experts about... <laughs> Emily, yay! <laughs> Emily May from the Xerces Society, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, the, the flooding question has been coming up for us as well. And I think we, like you, a lot of the research on flooding comes from it just happening during the course of a research project. So there have been, there have been research projects that have been interrupted by a flood uh, where they're looking at wild bee abundance and diversity. And then there was a flood and they looked to see what happened over time. And I think what we're seeing this year in my own backyard, which is clay plain, uh, totally saturated groundwater, uh, high water table, uh, those bees have kind of devastating impacts on the nesting of those bees that are underwater um, and that the larvae are sort of flooded out or they are no longer able to survive in the sort of anaerobic conditions under there. Sometimes there's also, with ex excessive moisture, you get fungal pathogens in their nests. Um, but it seems like over time, with those studies that have had some flooding interrupt a long-term monitoring project, um, that there is recolonization from other areas that did not get flooded. So if you have, for example, some topography where some bees got flooded out from the clay, then you get recolonization over time. So I think next year we're probably going to see lower abundance and diversity in the areas that saw a lot of flooding. But I think over time you do get that kind of recolonization. And I'm, I am curious if Spencer is still around, if what he has to say about it too. If so, Spencer, Thank please you. find the woman who asked the question, and, uh, <laughs> and then we can go from there. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, we took um, sort of a, a meadow when we moved. We bought a house and put it on an acre. We just left about a quarter of it totally natural, beautifully flowered this year, which is overgrown, crazy, and gorgeous. But I'm assuming it's going to need mowed at some point. Would you suggest not mowing in the fall? Do you have any idea about how and when to mow a natural meadow? So here's a question about whether and how to mow a natural meadow specifically at this time of year. Charlie? Yeah, so we're kind of up against the natural succession of this climate in this area. This area, if we disappeared tomorrow, would just turn back into forest. And that's what every, every one of these fields is going to, going to want to do eventually. So if you have a meadow and you just leave it there year after year, certainly you start seeing poplars come in and you start seeing uh, dogwoods come in, shrub dogwoods and things of that nature as they go through their natural succession. So even though it's not a great idea to mow things down in the fall because that's where a lot of pollinators might be, it, if you want to keep that as a meadow that's flowering at a certain stage, you do have to mow it. And the time to do it would be late in the season, like November or so, um, after all the pollinators have kind of settled down. If you can mow up high, that would be better. If you, the, the longer of a stem that you can leave there, whether it be a goldenrod or whatever, the, the higher chance that if there's a pollinator in there, they're going to be able to survive versus cutting it way down to the ground, like six inches tall. Thanks, Troy. 
Yes, front row. Did either or both of you read the article a week ago in the New Yorker saying called Is Beekeeping Wrong? And it talked about natural beekeeping and so forth. And if so, what's your response? Did, what's did, your reaction to it? So the question is, did either of you read the article in the New Yorker called Is Beekeeping Wrong? And do you have a reaction? So I was sent that article. <laughs> I tried to read it, but it was behind a paywall, and I'm cheap. But, I've, I, but I have been asked this multiple times and have had discussions with beekeepers and other people who are, you know, native uh, conservationists, you know, who want to see the native pollinators do better. Um, so beekeeping, honeybees are, because of the way we farm in our monocultures and the way we get our food, honeybees are the most important managed pollinator and, frankly, the way that we get the pollination services we do in these areas where there is no habitat left for the native pollinators to provide. Um, beekeeping is a, is a great hobby for those of us who you know, are, are backyard beekeepers. You can learn a lot in, about loving insects by farming a honeybee. But my argument would be to do it in a way that's very respectful and educated around what are the impacts that honeybees are having to native pollinators and how can we reduce those impacts? And there's a really, really great talk by Xerces Society about, um, what, do, you remember the, do you remember the title of it? So what about honeybees or something like that? And it, talk, and it, and it hits this whole topic right on, right on the head about what you can do if you're thinking about beekeeping and you're kind of caught in this conundrum. But it, you know, thinking about the, the pathogen spillover one is a, is a big one. Um, trying to make sure that you have a really solid varroa management plan so you're not spreading diseases to the native pollinators. And if you just want to be a beekeeper, to also do a, a pretty great job at also creating habitat because the honeybees are in such high densities that it can out, that the research is showing that it kind of outcompetes the floral resources of the native bees around it. So it's a tough question. Yeah, thank you. And I'm afraid we're going to end on a tough question. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, our, our speakers here tonight, Samantha and Charlie. I really appreciate, I appreciate both of you. I appreciate all of you for coming out. And also many thanks to our partners. Again, if you haven't seen the petition yet, we will have some out front. Um, feel free to contact any member of our coalition as well for more information about how to get involved in the days and weeks ahead. And thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.